Magandang magandang hapon po ulit sa ating lahat. Narito na naman tayo sa hindi na namin mabilang po na episode ng ating mga live stream na discussion sa napaka-importante mga usapin tungkol sa karapatang pantao. Nag-umpisa po tayo nung nag-start din ang ating lockdown, ang pandemic, at uh, alam namin lahat tayo ay nangangailangan no, ng pag-intindi pang maigi sa napakaraming usapin ng karapatang pantao lalo na yung naging impact sa ating uh, buhay, sa ating kalusugan, sa ating uh, ekonomiya, sa ating uh, mga karapatan. At ngayong hapon po ay natutuwa kami kasi makakapag-contribute kami sa isang diskasyon no, na napaka-importante sa ating buong bansa at doon sa ating pakikipagrelasyon sa iba pang mga bansa. Uh, ilang taon na natin pong uh, pinag, ano to, pinagdurusahan <laughs> or uh, uh, pinag, pinagtatakahan, ano ba yung foreign policy na sinasabi ng ating gobyerno? May independent foreign policy daw, pero parang nakikita natin may kinakampihan yata. No? Uh, dahil ba ito daw yung tutulong sa atin o may utang na loob tayo? Pero sa isang banda, alam natin na ang China, no? nire-respeto natin ang kanilang pagiging uh, sober, sober, sovereign na country, pero ibang usapin kapag nararamdaman natin na sinasaklaw na natin nila ang ating kalupaan at nanghihimasok na sila sa ating uh, soberenya at kalayaan. Ngayong hapon po ay napaka-swerte ng I Defend at ng Para dahil kasama natin ang mga eksperto sa usapin ng foreign policy. Uh, ngayong hapon po ay kasama natin si Atty. Cora Fabros, ang Vice President ng International Peace Bureau, si Prof. Dr. Ed Tadem, convener ng Alternative Development Program ng UP SEEDS, kasama din po natin si Atty. Virgie uh, Suarez na ilang araw yun ang nakikita sa television dahil doon sa napaka-controversial no, na issue ni Jennifer Laude. Uh, siya po ay Secretary General ng Kilusan at syempre uh, matagal na natin kakilala uh, at napaka-progresibong uh, dating congressman o representative ng Akbayan at ngayon po ay uh, chairperson ng laban ng masa si Professor Walden Bellion. At nagpapasalamat kami kay Joseph Burugunan po ng Focus on the Global South na siya ang magpapadaloy sa ating talakayan ngayon. Matuto po tayo no? at uh, magbigay ng mga comments at reaction sa ating mga Facebook at YouTube. Joseph, uh, please take over. Salamat. Maraming salamat. Maraming salamat, Rose. Uh, magandang hapon po at welcome po uli sa I Defend Online Discussion. Gaya ng nabanggit po ni Rose, bahagi po ito nung patuloy na talakayan ng I Defend sa mga mahalagang isyong kinakaharap ng ating bayan. Ako po si Joseph Purugana ng Focus on the Global South na mag, uh, sisilbing moderator po ng ating talakayan. At maraming salamat at good afternoon po sa ating mga speakers ngayong hapon. Noong August 24 po, si Dr. Alfred McCoy, isang American historian at long-time observer ng Philippine politics, nag-deliver siya ng isang online lecture entitled Geopolitics of Philippine Politics. Nilatag niya very clearly sa tingin ko ang challenges and the conundrum o palaisipan na kinakaharap ng Pilipinas sa pag-craft niya ng kanyang independent foreign policy. Dinescribe ni Dr. McCoy ang conflict sa West Philippine Sea as, quote, arguably only place in the planet, sabi niya, where there is serious risk of armed conflict between nuclear armed superpowers. Dagdag pa niya, sa surface daw, ay maaring tignan ang conflict na ito as a specific strategic dispute between Beijing and Washington over, over a commercial waterway which carries $5 trillion in world trade. Pero kung iuugat daw natin, sabi niya, sa kasaysayan, matitrace back natin na ang past policies and projects kung paano ang current thinking ay hinubog ng mga pag-aanalisa ng geopolitical na konteksto at agenda noong pang simula ng 1900s. Ang pagtingin halimbawa ng United States, no, at kinote niya si former Trump Defense Secretary James Mattis, 
na ang China di umano ay ang ay sa, ay sa pagsusulong nito ng kanyang sariling ambisyon ay nagtatangkang i-rewrite ang existing global order. Militarizing the South China Sea at bahagi daw ng estratehiya ng China ay ang paggamit ng predatory economics at ang pagpapile ng massive debt sa ibang mga bansa. Kinote naman niya si Chinese President Xi Jinping, no, nang sabi, our stance is steadfast, sabi naman ng China, and clear-cut when it comes to China's sovereignty. Every inch cannot be lost. At ang Pilipinas ay nasa gitna ng dalawang superpowers na ito. Sabi ni Makoy, forced to maneuver the geopolitical pressures shaping its international alignments and its domestic electoral politics. Dinescribe niya ang China as a rising power habang ang US naman as a declining power. Paano rin ang mga domestic issues at imperatives sa loob ng US at China nagsashape din ng sarili nilang foreign policy? Kung titignan naman natin ano, ba, ano naman ang mandato sa Pilipinas, no? nasa konstitusyon no? ang pagtataguyod ng isang independent foreign policy. So malinaw naman na ang batayan at pamantayan ng pagbubuo ng isang independent foreign policy at ang mga haligi nito. Subalit so, kailangan rin natin tignan ang iba't iba pang mga external na kondisyon o sitwasyon. Ano ang impluensya nito sa atin, mga nangyayari sa ibang bansa, at paano ninanavigate ng Estado ang kasalukuyang mga realidad na ito para isulong ang national interest ng bansa. Nandiyan na limbawa ang yun nga, yung geopolitical agenda ng US at China, no. Pero nandiyan din yung talakayan sa COVID, no. Ano ba ang relasyon nito sa foreign policy? Nan tayo ay nasa gitna pa rin ng isang pandaigdigang health crisis. At ang Pilipinas ang may pinakamataas na kaso sa Asia, pinakamatagal na lockdown. Syempre kaugnay nito ang impact ng pandemya sa ekonomiya, sa trabaho at kabuhayan, sa sitwasyon ng mga overseas Filipino workers. Lahat ng ito ay may relasyon din sa usaping foreign policy. Nandiyan ang isyu ng worsening human rights sa bansa. No, kamakailan naglabas ang report ang Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights na nagsasabing widespread, systematic at large scale ang violation sa Pilipinas. Ang Pilipinas, ayon naman sa global witness, ay isa sa pinakadelikadong bansa para sa land and environmental rights defenders. At may implikasyon rin ba ito? No, at anong imahe ang pinapakita ng Pilipinas sa ibang bansa? May implikasyon ba ito sa ating foreign policy? Sa pinakahuling sona ni Duterte noong Hulyo, may silip tayo kung paano inarticulate ng administrasyon ang kanyang kasalukuyang foreign policy. Sabi ni Duterte, We work without fail to protect our rights in the South China Sea, neither beholden nor upon to anyone. We broaden the boundaries of Philippine diplomacy. We built productive ties with everyone willing to engage us on the basis of equality and mutual respect. And we redefined our relationships with our most important partners. So, sa pinang China, ano si nabi ni Duterte sa Sona? China is claiming it. We are claiming it. China has the arms. We do not have it. So it is sim as simple as that. They are in possession of the property. So si nabi niya dito niya si nabi na inutil ako jan. Wala siyang magawa. So maraming mga issue at mga kaganapan na mahalagang matalakay kung pag-uusapan natin ng paksang foreign policy. Gaya ng nabanggit ni Rose, maswerte po tayo at may panel tayo na tutulungan tayong himayin ang mga isyong ito at intindihin ano nga ba ang mga bagay at kundis konsiderasyon sa pag-shape ng independent foreign policy at ano ang pwede nating itulak na progresibong agenda sa pagtataguyod ng international solidarity at regional cooperation kaugnay nito. Simulan po natin ang ating talakayan sa pagbibigay ng uh, space at ang um, floor ngayon kay Attorney Cora Fabros. Cora. Maraming salamat, Joseph. Uh, at maraming salamat dun sa magandang introduction dito sa ating uh, pag-uusapan ngayong hapon. Uh, at, uh, at this point, ay <coughs> gusto ko magpasalamat sa I Defend <coughs> for... Uh, you know, uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to discuss a very important issue uh, uh, during this period of the pandemic. Um, it's uh, ano a uh, timeless itong issue na to, no? Um, at uh, gusto ko rin uh, 
mag uh, bumati sa inyong lahat at sa ating mga kaibigan uh, uh, hindi lamang dito sa Pilipinas na nakikinig ngayon marahil kailangan nating sabihin magandang umaga sa inyo good morning to all of you uh, whoever and uh, uh, wherever you are uh, uh, thank you for joining us and um, I think um, I should begin by saying that um, I have been tasked to speak about uh, what shapes national foreign policy and how this impact on human rights in the country. Um, let me begin by saying that uh, my talk will be referring to the work that Focus on the Global South has done on this particular issue. Uh, that started way back in 2008 um, through the development roundtable series that brought, uh, that sought to look into, study, and analyze uh, Philippine foreign policy in its desire to bring to the fore, to a broader constituency, the work of shaping foreign policy, which has been and has continued to be a domain of a few inside the government bureaucracy. Uh, I also uh, would also be referring to Galil Castillo's article on a review of, uh, of the Duterte's uh, independent foreign policy, um, believing that uh, foreign policy should not be a sole domain of a very few, that it should be a concern uh, of the people and advocating an alternative foreign policy is important work um, in shaping the direction of the policy of the nation. Um, I was part of the technical working group on alternative foreign policy. We did a, a few, uh, we did a review of the laws, the policies and the programs of uh, the Philippines Basically, the Philippine Constitution, uh, which was the, the most important uh, input here, um, and that it defined in no uncertain terms, um, Malinao, uh, what Philippine foreign policy should be. Uh, and I don't know whether NECA is ready with the, <laughs> the lone slide that I'm going to show, uh, the provision of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. Um, let's uh, go through it very quickly, um, which is the uh, Article 2 um, uh, in the Declaration of Principles and State Policies. Um, Section 2 speaks of uh, the Philippines renounces war as an instrument of national policy, adopts the generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the land, and adheres to the policy of peace, equality, justice, freedom, cooperation, and amity with all nations. Section seven, um, I, 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 which is the most important to me of the four provisions that I'm going to read, uh, section seven states, you know, the state shall pursue an independent foreign policy in its relations with other states, the paramount consideration shall be national sovereignty, territorial integrity, national interest, and the right to self-determination. Uh, section eight also, um, uh, the Philippines, consistent with the national interest, adopts and pursues a policy of freedom from nuclear weapons in its territory. And finally, section 19, uh, the state shall provide a self-reliant and independent national economy effectively controlled by Filipinos. From there, we could see that um, if we review uh, government policies and uh, whether they are in line with what the constitution requires, um, and uh, I would like to uh, quote Professor Roland Simbulan here in his paper, which was part of the DRTS then and published by uh, Focus in the Global South. 
um, he reviewed the critical issues on foreign policy. And let me quote from that. For a long time, he's already, many Philippine regimes bowed to the imposition of the advocates of imperialism and swallowed the sugar-coated poison of the IMF World Bank, which wrecked havoc to our national economy and has only brought further inequality and poverty to this country. And he continued on and said, many of our national woes, including foreign debt, widespread poverty, worsening in unemployment, are caused by having been entangled, if not integrated, in the decisions, activities, and influence of countries with dominant economies and with greatest influence on institutions like the IMF World Bank and WTO that impacts on our local politics to a great extent." End of quote. This is exactly where we are today. Um, made even more pronounced during this period of the pandemic and the impending new geopolitical transformation that could happen in the next decade, as Joseph have, have uh, said in the beginning of the introduction to this webinar. Uh, friends, we are at a critical uh, juncture uh, and with the rise of China as world economic power and as a rising military power, we need to look at uh, we need to look at uh, the what shapes uh, um, excuse me, I'm losing a page. <laughs> um, at the same time, we need to watch its rise as a military power. If we look at the military spending um, globally, there is always that direction to reduce, uh, to reduce military spending in the face of the pandemic. That's where we are. And yet, there is a clear indication that our government there is no clear indication that our government will reduce its military spending. Uh, whether this is for our internal security or for uh, external threat. I don't have the exact figure right now, but we know that the Duterte uh, government negotiated a two billion US dollar contract for arms and weapons acquisition. So, um, with the United States, in the midst of this pandemic, there are other big acquisitions that I will not mention here, but we can uh, share the data later. We also know that there is an ongoing negotiation for a return of the US Navy and the cooperation of Australia for joint naval facility in Subic, the former US military base. We are aware that US contractors like Cerverus and Australian contractors uh, like Austral and local contractors even are involved in this project. This would not happen without the Philippine government's approval, for sure. While Duterte sought to cancel the visiting forces agreement with the US, that pronouncement is nowhere to be fulfilled. According to his spokesman, um, I was listening to uh, to him yesterday, uh, last night, one of the rare moments that I watch um, uh, news on television. 
the cancellation is in the meantime suspended because of the pandemic. The Philippine military is one of the nine countries that continued out of 26 countries that continued and uh, <laughs> you know persevered persevered to join the RIMPAC. You know, RIMPAC is one of the biggest, if not uh, the biggest, uh, joint military exercise and war games in the waters of the Hawaiian island. Council RIMPAC, which uh, we are part of, um, the Council RIMPAC coalition sought for its cancellation but the U.S. held it just the same, uh, shortening it and uh, only to a week instead of the usual 14 days, and uh, only with participation of nine uh, defense partners. One of it is the Philippines, mainly because it does not want to show that uh, or create an impression that it is a declining power. And recently, we witnessed another of this capitulation through its handling of the Jennifer Laude case, which I'm sure my sister will not fail to mention, being the lawyer of Jennifer Laude. I also spoke of an impending change in the next decade. China today is the world's second military spender after the United States. As it announced in May 2020, a 6.6% .6 increase in military budget and significant, but also the smallest increase in the decade, in, 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 in a decade. Other questions, uh, Two, um, other countries too um, have announced, you know, increase in their military spending. Most of them in Asia continent. Uh, we can look at Pakistan with a 7.4% increase, uh, India 6%, and South Korea 7.4%. Many countries in Asia also have increases in military spending. In Europe, it's the same. Military spending is an important indicator of the direction of our security concerns, not only here in Asia, but also globally. That's one reason why the International Peace Bureau decided to focus on this through its global campaign on military spending, or what we call GCOMs. Despite the plea from the UN for a global ceasefire, conflicts continued in parts of the world. Global arms, exports, which uh, fuels these conflicts most of the time, have risen steadily with the United States as the biggest arms manufacturer and exporter that, uh, in the world today, uh, rushing to facilitate new deals. Uh, so it's good business for arms deals at this uh, uh, moment in our history. For us in the Philippines, with the military's big involvement in the campaign against COVID-19, uh, it is a validation of an ongoing global turn towards authoritarianism. Uh, the anti-terrorism law of 2020 is a classic example of a government that tried to muzzle not only the press, but people. And we see here the human rights defenders are the people on the line of fire who are critical of the government uh, policies. One thing that's very clear to us today is that 
This pandemic has vividly demonstrated the kind of government we have today. A government that not only violates our constitution, it also displays its incompetence and its reliance to military to get its way. Add to that its lack of transparency and utter uh, disregard for human rights. It will be interesting to ask some questions at this point. Um, these are very crucial questions, I guess. Um, uh, for our external relations, which uh, um, bear an impact on our domestic uh, situation. With China rise as economic power, even military power, as I said, what does that mean for the Philippines? and for the region. Uh, answers that I think we will find, uh, questions that we will find answers to our other uh, speakers that will speak after me. What does this mean for the Philippines? In the next decade, especially uh, for us internally. Second, what are what are we learning out of this pandemic? Are we doing enough? Will we be courageous and strong enough um, to make uh, the kind of uh, constructive uh, involvement and resistance? But it is also uh, an opening that uh, that we are uh, preparing to change the discourse. You know, um, we could often hear that, you know, in, in, in the face of difficulties and challenges, there's a problem, but there is also, there are also opportunities. For sure, the current system that we have today, uh, will not be able to solve the problem that we have. And, uh, and I think that that seems to be, or that is an important work that we need to face. Uh, at this point, I, I, I think that uh, having posed those two questions, yes. I hope that I have contributed and have set the, the tone <laughs> towards the direction of our discussion this afternoon uh, with the hope that we would eventually uh, be able to sort a democratic, principled, and independent and strategic foreign policy for the Philippines. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat, uh, Cora, sa yung inputs. Uh, magandang segue yung last points mo about the alternative uh, independent foreign policy. So, mag-jump na po tayo kagad uh, para hindi tayo mag-waste ng oras. Tinatawagan po natin si Dr. Ed Tadem para sa kanyang 10-minute uh, uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, maraming salamat, uh, Cora. Maraming salamat din, Joseph. At magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Uh, didiretso na ako sa aking presentation no? sabagat uh, humihinga ako ng paumanhin kanina sabagat baka lalampasan ko yung uh, uh, required uh, speaking time na uh, 10 minutes so itong ano what, what I'm going to present is basically uh, divided into two parts one is the issue of foreign relations and foreign policy and the second is on the issue of territorial disputes uh, in general, uh, not specifically talking about uh, the South China Sea, but uh, alternative approaches to addressing territorial disputes uh, in the region and probably elsewhere in the world. I would also like to use this uh, presentation as a tribute 
to my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Dr. Eileen Baviera, who unfortunately passed away last March due to COVID-19. She was, uh, and, uh, until she left us, probably the country's foremost expert on foreign relations, and uh, she was recognized as such. So some parts of my presentation will uh, draw from her own insights and analysis of Philippine foreign relations, but also on the territorial disputes issue. So the first thing I'd like to uh, share is that about 10 years ago, uh, we had um, a project it was the, to celebrate the University of the Philippines Centennial. And it was a project on looking at a thematic assessment of Philippine foreign relations. And by the way, uh, we all agreed that instead of using foreign policy, we use foreign relations because uh, foreign relations is a more encompassing term. Foreign policy is just a part of foreign relations. And foreign relations is actually the basis for developing a foreign policy. So when we talk about the uh, various activities and experiences, state to state, country to country relations, we are actually basically talking about foreign relations. So that, that project uh, had this particular perspective. Uh, that is uh, currently the country was then, and I think still now, facing a crossroads in Philippine foreign, foreign policy. Various challenges have be, are, were being addressed, such as the obvious economic and political decline of the country, which is still continuing, problems arising from globalization, the rise of new Asian powers, such as China and India, the trends towards regional integration, the decline of the United States in a once unipolar world, which at the time was already quite evident, particularly since the uh, crisis, the, uh, the global crisis took uh, place uh, at this time, which started in the United States. Uh, um, the imposition of multilateral trade regimes and the subsequent collapse of the Washington Consensus. Challenges to the Uni United Nations, to European integration the resurgence of oil politics and the politics of identity, the religion, and the rise of new nationalisms. Now, before we did our research, we noted that most previous research and documentation of Philippine foreign, foreign relations have focused on chronological accounts of events and have often been state-centered or focused on the role of individuals. The project we had intended to focus on specific themes and shall thereby go beyond chronologies, beyond the recording of Philippine reactions to externalities, and beyond the traditional focus on the role of the state and individual personalities. There were eight of us who were in this project, and we all had different uh, topics. But the topic that uh, I assigned to myself was that of democratizing international relations and empowering the people. But before I go into explaining what I did, uh, uh, for that project, uh, Eileen Baviera herself uh, wrote uh, uh, really a, a paper called Philippine Foreign Policy, Challenges for the Next Generation. She wrote this in the midst of our, uh, while the, our research was going on. And she said, and I quote, the most important point about any country's foreign policy is that it can only be as effective as the extent to which its government is perceived to be credible consistent and clear about the nation's interests and goals. Without a strategic vision, clear guideposts, and a stable environment set by decision makers and actors at the home front, foreign relations can go adrift, become reactive, or even suffer paralysis, no matter how brilliant one's diplomats are or how, how brilliant they are in English, as someone had uh, tried to impose on us uh, a few days ago or how huge the resources devoted to public relations campaigns and the upkeep of Philippine embassies and missions abroad. But in addition, popular support is also needed for the strategic vision and the strong sense of nationhood in order to animate our diplomacy and to remind our leaders, especially our presidents, that they are merely presuming to represent the sovereign will of the people in all their foreign dealings and not their personal proclivities or their whatever they think of themselves as presidents or leaders. And then she and then Eileen goes ahead and asks the question, what about the standpoint of our foreign policy? 
against this broad panorama of globalization and Asian regionalism is the question of Filipino nationhood and national identity. What should the foreign policy reflect about the interests, aspirations, values, and identity of the Filipinos as a people? These are what presumably drives foreign policy. Failing to claim and articulate this Filipino identity or worldview may mean forsaking the project of nation building altogether. So the question of values and identity is a challenge that must be faced. In the international community, if and when a choice needs to be made between our advocacy for peaceful, peaceful dispute settlement on the one hand and the need for prompt military intervention on the other, between promotion of democracy and human rights on the one hand and the principle of non-interference in the sovereign affairs of another state on the other, where should the Filipinos stand? If we have to choose between the um, impulse to preserve the institutions of global governance led by the great powers on the one hand and the need for greater inclusiveness and more democratic participation on the other, what choice would the Filipino make? And then she ends with this. We are an archipelago located in a strategic maritime crossroads. The waters between our islands impacting our lives nearly as much as the land does. Many of our people live in coastal communities. We supply an inordinate proportion of the world's seafarers. We are the center of marine biodiversity on this planet. Yet we often ignore the impact of the ocean and its resources in how we plan and organize for development in this country. In foreign relations, we have a choice of whether our surrounding oceans shall serve to unite us with or separate us from neighboring peoples, and whether the resources of our exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, are to be treated as objects of competition or of cooperation with other states. Thus ended uh, uh, her, her uh, uh, Eileen Baviera's uh, foreign policy paper. And now, I'd, I'd like to move on now with uh, quoting excerpts from our paper. This paper was co-written by myself and uh, Teresa Encarnacion Tadem, entitled Democratic, Democratizing International Relations and Bringing the People Back in the Philippine Case. Conventional studies on international relations simply see them in terms of state-to-state -state linkages. But while this view has long dominated the discipline, the fact is that a significant number of international networks and cross-border ties are initiated and maintained by non-state players. Many of these activities are undertaken to confront or engage state and multi-state institutions who are perceived to be remiss in their obligations to their citizens and internationally recognized protocols. International relations as practiced by non-state players or NSPs, principally civil society organizations, CSOs or NGOs, and social movements, SMs, is an often neglected and little researched field of study. Yet the networks and interactions of CSOs at the global stage have been instrumental in introducing new policies and programs, both at the national and international levels, that would otherwise not be undertaken by state players and multi-state actors alone. It is the pressure exerted by CSOs and SMs that have forced a rethinking and revising of many practices and principles that guide international relations. The very existence and vibrancy of the CSOs and SN show that another mode of foreign relations is possible, that which emanates and is nurtured from below. This raises the issue of democratizing international relations by involving non-elite and popular interactions at the regional, sub-regional, and global levels. The Philippines is an ideal country for looking at international relations from below at, as it has a rich trove of such experiences. Indeed, Philippine-based CSOs and SNs have been at the forefront of international campaigns and networks on various cost-oriented issues and concerns. A key in democratizing international relations in the Philippine experience is the evolution of people-to-people -people relations with other societies. Although this has generally been marginalized in the study of the country's foreign relations, one cannot ignore its significance, particularly with the failure of the Philippine government to address pressing political, economic, and social cultural concerns. The Philippines' people-to-people -people relations have witnessed support given to repressed victims of society, 
such as workers, peasants, indigenous peoples, urban poor, women, LGBTQ persons, and others through the establishment of solidarity movements. Democratizing international relations touches on the three general aspects of people-to-people -people relations, the political, the economic, and the social-cultural, which are not mutually exclus exclusive and are actually intertwined with one another. And it is important to look at this people-to-people -people relations from a historical perspective through particular eras of Philippine history. In general, social movements play important roles in framing movement agenda, cultivating collective identities, and mobilizing collective causes. Now, from this particular research uh, study, which we did, I now move into the year 2017. This was the year when the Philippines hosted uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations uh, meeting. Um, but, but I'd like to use 2020, actually, as a, uh, as a, base, as a base for discussion. So in 2020, ASEAN marked the 55th year of its founding. Civil society organizations and people's organizations across the region have been challenging the regional organization to address issues and concerns that affect the peoples of Southeast Asia. And the main forum for civil society engagement with ASEAN has been the ASEAN Civil Society Conference, ASEAN People's Forum, or ACSC APF, established in 2005. Now, throughout its 15 years of engagement with ASEAN, ACSC APF has focused on organizing various types of activities, um, all as a means of engaging with the ASEAN summit. The question, however, is whether these 15 years of CSO engagement with ASEAN has borne fruit. The answer is it has not. And an internal ACSC APF 10 year review in 2015 concluded that individual ASEAN member countries have consistently resisted and vacillated with regards to civil society participation engagement, and that ASEAN and its member governments have been seen to be more comfortable with the private sector and academic and research think tanks than with civil society. And this negative assessment has been reiterated in succeeding ACSC APF gatherings up to the last one in, in uh, Thailand last year. Now, given the disappointing results from years of engagement with ASEAN, utilizing modes of, oh, that's been outlined, what is needed now really is a new vision for engagement by civil society in general and by the ASEAN and by the ACSC APF. Uh, we must now think and act outside the ASEAN box. We must develop strategies that go beyond mere assertions of independence and autonomy from the state's agenda. We should lead the way and initiate the process of establishing new regional, a new regional integration model that is an alternative to the existing ASEAN process, one that is based on people-to-people -people interactions rather than state-to-state -state relations or purely market-oriented interactions. As a starting point, we need to acknowledge that Southeast Asian peoples and communities have for many years and on their own have been engaged in alternative heterodox and non-mainstream practices encompassing economic, political, social, and cultural aspects. So the strategy is to build on the existing initiatives and practices at the ground level, which are alternative and non-mainstream. The 15-year experience of engagement with, with the official ASEAN process has taught civil society movements in Southeast Asia valuable lesson, lessons that should guide its future trajectories. Disappointments, rejections, and disillusionments should now be a thing of the past and chalked up to experience. The real challenge facing civil society organizations in Southeast Asia today lies from outside and beyond the established ASEAN process. We must now be firmly linked and tightly interconnected with grassroots initiatives and, create, and, and, and the creative practices of real peoples struggling to carve a better and more dignified life for their families and communities and for the future. Uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> Just the last part. Huh? And yes. this, is on, this is on territorial disputes. And here again, I, I, I provide an engagement of some sort with uh, my friend, uh, the late Eileen San Pablo Baviera in, in a 
in a tribute which I wrote to her and which will be published in the Philippine Journal of Public Policy. I, I would like to cite expert uh, excerpts from that. Uh, escalation of conflict between the Philippines and China over competing claims in the South China Sea international dispute has often been unfortunately characterized by bellicose, patriotic, chauvinist, and racist sentiments on both sides of the disputed sea. States involved in the South China Sea ter territorial disputes bunker down behind what I would term as divisive and counterproductive concepts such as absolute territorial integrity, absolute sovereignty, and inexpugnable boundaries, and other hardline ultra-nationalist and ultra-patriotic posturings taken by protagonists from both China and the Philippines. Despite some published accounts that show otherwise, Eileen and I were probably essentially and at heart on the same page with respect to the Philippines-China conflict in particular and territorial disputes in general. My own position on this was laid out in a 2019 paper I published, which states, conventional discussions on territorial disputes have focused mainly on the issues of nationalism, national identity, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and inviolable state boundaries. And from these manifestations of chauvinism, racism, and right-wing ultranationalism have subsequently surfaced that only serve to heighten conflicts and not to resolve them. There is a need to move away from these divisive and counterproductive perspectives. Now, in 2016, Eileen Baviera wrote of her innermost thoughts on the South China Sea dispute, revealing a quite enlightened and non-nation state-centric view. As various claimant states, including the Philippines, quote, quarreled over the reefs, the waters, and resources of the Ch South China Sea, Eileen wrote, and I quote, it seems that governments have let their primordial territorial instincts rule them. There is folly in this. In other words, it is foolishness. They seek control of the waters as if oceans can be tamed, claimed, and then fenced off like the land. In truth, no one knows exactly what they are claiming. Much of the marine life in the depths of the South China Sea remain unexplored. The fish that traverse these seas migrate from one part to another, recognizing no boundaries other than those created by changes in the temperature of the, of the water column, unquote. Flying over the disputed seas and looking out over the seemingly limitless ocean, Eileen was engulfed by a sense of being free from territorial boundaries and how being, and how, unquote, how being creatures of the land has taught us, has taught most of us to think in terms of the state and its narrow interests, unquote. And let me quote a passage again from that uh, article she wrote. As I look down at the smallness of the land features and the distances between them in proportion to the vast expanse of ocean, I cannot help but think of how presumptuous and foolish men are to think that this all belongs to certain countries. Because once upon a time, some person named or mapped or fished or navigated here before anyone else did. These reefs and shoals, these waters, were here long before today's modern nation states emerged, and they will be here long after many have passed from the sea. I envy the free creatures of the sea, for we creatures of the land have become captive of our own illusions of conquest and control." End of quote. There is therefore, and this is now me speaking, there is therefore a need for giving more attention to people-to-people -to -people concerns and people-centered approaches. And I argue that notions of absolute sovereignty and permanent territorial rights are counterproductive and their uncompromising assertion will only lead at best to an uncomfortable stalemate, stalemate or worse, outright war. What we need is to surface instead alternative approaches anchored on, number one, a shared regional identity, number two, the notion of a common pool resource, number three, the notion of a common heritage of mankind, 
Number four, the issue of joint development. And lastly, and probably more important, to give more attention to popular voices. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. And thank you for quoting those wonderful passages from Dr. Baviera. Sigurado po ako kung nandito pa siya kasama natin ay isa siya sa mga panelists, sigurado. So si Cora and si Ed po have uh, given us very good overview no, of the basis, the drivers, and the elements of independent foreign policy. Pero more, ex more importantly, I think yung expanded the uh, discussion to look at foreign relations and the role that people play in pushing alternative and progressive regimes and approaches to building international solidarity. Pero they touched on geopolitical challenges as well. At ito tayo, papasok po tayo sa segment natin ngayon with our next two speakers on, on that question of and touch um ed touch on the the territorial dispute ano um particularly around yung yung issue nung kung saan tayo nakalocate sa mapa no which can be seen as either an advantage or a curse because we're navigating through yung two superpowers and the ongoing territorial dispute and conflicts nga no importante rin pong ma-unpack natin no saan ba nang gagaling eto mga super ano bang agenda ng ano bang superpower agenda anong agenda ng US anong agenda ng China sa pagtingin uh, nila sa atin in relation to their own uh, foreign policies and their in their own economic and military agenda ang susunod po nating speaker ay si attorney Virgie Suarez ng Kilosan Virgie yes uh -huh. um Okay. Uh, magandang hapon sa ating lahat, no? Uh, sa akin nakaatas yung, ano kaya, no? Magandang tingnan, ano ang disenyo ng Estados Unidos sa Southeast Asia? Ako gusto ko agad sabihin na kung gusto nating tingnan o maasilipin ang disenyo ng Estados Unidos sa Southeast Asia, alam mo, silipin natin kung ano ang disenyo ng Estados Unidos dito sa bansang Pilipinas. Kung meron mang isang lugar o isang bansa na napaka-strategic No? Uh, para sa US, ito ay yung bansang Pilipinas. Dahil ito yung pinakamalapit para no, makita niya, matingnan niya, makontrol niya ang China. No? Kaya napakahalaga na kapag uh, gusto natin makita ang buong plano ng US sa Southeast Asia, tingnan natin ano ang disenyo niya sa bansang Pilipinas. At pangalawa, kung gusto rin naman nating makita kung ano ang uh, itsura, no? ano talaga ang polisiya ng ating gobyerno pagdating sa pakikipagrelasyon sa, sa ibang bansa, no? yung tinatawag na natin na foreign policy, mahalaga no? na tingnan natin no? itong kaso ni Jennifer Laude. No? At doon makikita natin kung anong klaseng foreign policy meron tayo. Sige, dipuntahan ko muna yung una. No? Silipin natin, ano, ano kaya kaya ang disenyo ng US sa Southeast Asia? No, kanina nabanggit na nung nakaraan ng uh, SONA, nabanggit mismo ni Duterte na babalik, no? babalik uli ang sundalong Amerikano sa Subic. At ang Subic ay kilala na may pinakamagandang, pinakamagandang ano, ano, uh, port. At dito ang partnership at maliwanag na partnership no, ng uh, US at ng Australia. Kaya makikita ka agad dito na pangunahin no, sa disenyo ng Estados Unidos no, ang pagpapalakas ng kanyang uh, naval forces, ang kanyang uh, marine forces. Remember, marine is an elite force no, ng, uh, ng Estados Unidos. Kaya yun na agad, pasilip ka agad. No? Uh, pinagmalaki ya ano ni ni ni, uh, ni Duterte yung kanya ano yung dalawang bilyong dolyares na pagpapautang ng uh, ng Estados Unidos para sa armas anong ibig sabihin nito ibig sabihin ang Estados Unidos din ay hindi magdadalawang salita sa pagpapautang sa anumang bansa kapag ito ay may kin lalo na kakampanya kontrolado niya kapag ito ay may kinalaman no sa pagbili ng armas at ang ating bansang Pilipinas sa gitna ng pandemya ay bumili no ng uh, sasakyang uh, pandigma sasakyang pandagat na pandigma mula sa Korea at 
Uh, itong uh, nakakalungkot no nasa gitna ng pandemya ang inang ang, ang ang ating gobyerno ay uh, uh, nangungutang hindi para no isalba ang ang buhay ng ating mga mamayan kung hindi bumili ng uh, maraming armas bumili ng uh, sasakyang pangdigma at itong sasakyang pangdigma na binili mula sa Korea ay ito yung uh, ginamit ng ating gobyerno para sa kanyang partisipasyon dun sa tinatawag na Rim of Pacific uh, uh, Warfare. Ito yung pinakamalaking ngayong uh, maritime exercise or maritime warfare. Kaya kagad-agad, ipinapakita nito ng Rim Pack na ito na nandito ngayon ang disenyo no, ng Estados Unidos. May kinalaman sa Marine, may kinalaman ano sa sa uh, sa, sa Navy. Ito yung kanyang gustong uh, palakasin. At uh, itong rimpak na ito nandito kasama ang Singapore, of course, ang Pilipinas nandiyan, ang Singapore, ang New Zealand, ang Australia. Kaya itong rimpak na ito kaagad-agad makikita natin no kung ano ang gustong gawin ng Estados Unidos sa buong Southeast Asia. Um uh, pinigma nitong uh, As early as 2019, pinagmalaki na ng US, no, yung kanyang uh, nagbigay na siya ng mga planning guidance na no, doon sa tinatawag niya National Defense uh, Strategy, no. At itong National Defense Strategy, nilagyan nila ng kulay nitong February 20, uh, ano, uh, 2020. Uh, ito talaga yung uh, um, mas maraming ano no uh, mas maraming uh, tank battalions kung dati maraming tank battalions maraming infantry at artillery units no ngayon ang gusto ng i-maximize talaga ay yung uh, naval no uh, uh, naval competition dito sa kanyang mga uh, kakampi o kasangga no nagfo-focus ngayon ang US Marines no sa tinatawag na long range strike Uh, para dun sa kanyang maritime na kampanya dun sa Western uh, Pacific laban sa China. Um, magandang tingnan din natin no, na um, yung meron nga yung mga bagong panukalang batas na isinusulong uh, ang, ang, ang militar no, sa Estados Unidos. Nandiyan yung tinatawag na Indo-Pacific uh, Deterrence In Initiative. Ang lahat uh, Sabihin, um, meron dalawang batas na isinusulong. Ito ay um, ang objective lalo ni, na ito ay nakabatay doon sa European Deterrence Initiative. No? At um, ang, pangunahing, um, ang pangunahing dito ay uh, yung objective nitong dalawang batas na ito ay yung tuwirang uh, pagpapalaka sa naval at paano kaagad uh, nandito paano agad kukumpente siya hen no I, ang, ang 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 bansang uh, China ng uh, sa usapin no uh, sa usaping uh, militar nandoon ka agad yung nakatingin tong dalawang batas na ito ay nakatingin ka agad uh, how to compete no uh, China by uh, empowering or by giving more no capability training budget no military forces dito sa uh, naval no And of course, dito dun sa may uh, batas na ito na kasalukuyang nakasalang, no? Yung mapahusay lalo nila yung desenyo at postura nila, no, sa Asia Pacific. Dagdagan, no, yung mga tinatawag na capability, yung prepositioning, no, ng uh, pag-iimbak ng mga fuel, bala, kasangkapan at mga gamit pantigma. At siyempre yung kapasidad no doon sa maintenance doon sa sa buong region para tiyakin na uh, sustainable no yung logistics uh, sa para sa tuloy-tuloy na pag-atake ganun nagpaplano ang ang US uh, hindi lang doon sa simpleng uh, pag uh, pagtitiyak ng kanyang puwersa no sa iba't ibang uh, bansa kung hindi uh, gumagawa ng mga uh, panukalang batas ngayon para tiyakin na magiging malakas ito sa pakikipagkumpetensya niya sa bansang China. Uh, kaya din, naka, at yun, makikita agad natin, ano, anong connection ito sa ating bansa? Tingnan mo, sa gitna ng pandemya, ginagawa ito ng Estados Unidos. Kahit pa, no, mahigit sa 4,000 no, military soldiers ang nagkaroon ng uh, naging positive sa COVID, ay tuloy-tuloy itong mga ginagawa ng Estados Unidos. 
Kung tingnan natin sa Pilipinas, ano ang ginawa ni, na, uh, ni Duterte? Di ba? Isulong ang anti-terrorism bill. No? At itong anti-terrorism bill, originally ito ay nasa sa ilalim na Human Security Act, which is actually an imposition o dikta ng Estados Unidos. Okay. Build up. Build up ng naval forces ng US sa Indo-Pacific. Yun ang uh, ginagawa ngayon ng, uh, ng US. At kaya naman, yung habang uh, of, uh, alam natin yung malaking uh, tunggalian o away na sa pagitan ng uh, China at ng Estados Unidos at uh, yung buong uh, ASEAN ano, ay nagkaroon ng uh, matapang na posisyon laban sa aggression ng China sa South China Sea. At ang ginawa naman siyempre ng, uh, ng US, no, yung pinakita niya ang kanyang lakas, no? Uh, yung kanyang naval force uh, sa pamamagitan ng joint uh, training no sa Philippine Sea ng carrier strike groups na pinatawag na USS Nimitz at USS Regan. Uh, at siyempre ag- ang naging sagot noon again ng ng, ng, ng ay, pagsasanay naman ng China sa South China Sea. Of course dito pumosisyon ang ating uh, gobyerno no na na ki- na lalaban daw, ha, sabi ni Teddy Loxin, lalaban, no? At hindi pala lampasin kapag umabot sa Pilipinas ang ginagawang ito ng uh, China. Uh, doon makikita mo kaagad, uh, totoo ba ito o paano? Dahil uh, si Duterte mismo ay nagsabi na inutil siya pagdating sa usapin, di ba, ng uh, territorial dispute at Uh, uh, in so far as China is concerned. Ibig sabihin sa pagitan ng China at Pilipinas, uh, siya ay inutil. And yet, magsasabi ng ganito si, si Teddy Doxin. Um, again, dahil talagang ang US ay nakatingin sa China at uh, uh, habang nagsasanay no, ng, ang Navy ng China, uh, pinalipat no, ng US Navy ang ang uh, ang US ni Meets at US Regan sa South China Sea at doon nga nagtuloy yung training. Pagpapalakas sa US Pacific Military Base. Uh, at dito ay pinapakita ito ng RIMPAC. At dito nga kasama tayo. Uh, uh, siguro later on maganda mapag-usapan. Pero lahat ng ito, ang buong, kung at ito ang... Um, Uh, ang buong desenyo niya no, sa Southeast Asia at makikita natin agad ito sa pagtiningnan natin ang ating bansang Pilipinas. Okay, foreign policy. Ano ba ang desenyo ng foreign policy natin? Ano? Ito tingnan lang natin yung kaso ni, uh, ni Jennifer Laude. Tingnan lang natin ang visiting forces agreement. How this lopsided agreement actually um, work sa kaso ni uh, Jennifer Laude. At ngayon nga, no, uh, na kahit pa uh, uh, pinatay no, uh, si Jennifer Laude, ay ngayon ay uh, kahit na sampung taon ng kanyang uh, dapat na siya makulong kaagad-agad ay, at siya ay nakulong sa special facility, nagsosodo siya, very privileged, naka-aircon siya, ay uh, ngayon ay uh, nagsam, nag, nag apply no for uh, GCTA at ito ay agad-agad na inaprubahan. Inaprubahan ito nang wala man lamang uh, uh, ayota of evidence no showing that a good conduct as defined by the GCTA. At uh, nakakalungkot because the DOJ did not object. Our prosecutors did not object. No dito makikita natin ang epekto No, anong mentalidad o ano naging epekto ng klase ng foreign policy, ng klase ng foreign uh, relationship meron tayo sa Estados Unidos. Yung agara at nangyari ng lahat ng ito na mabilis ang pagkilos, kaso ni, ni Pemberton, pagkatapos na i-cancel ni Duterte ang termination ng VFA. Doon pa lang sa ginawa niyang uh, uh, termination and then cancellation of the termination, ipinapakita nito ang urong sulong no na ni, ni na postura ni Duterte yun din no ang klase ng foreign policy meron tayo yun din ang klase ng ng uh, relasyon meron tayo kung paanong nilalaro no o kayang laruin ng US yung ating batas to 
diba? to favor pampered God, ganun din ang klase kung paano kayang-kaya at madaling laruin ang Estados Unidos ang ating bansa, lalo na sa panahon ni Duterte. At, sa git at lahat ng ito ay nangyayari sa gitna ng pandemic kung saan mahirap kumilos, mahirap para sa atin ang kumilos, mahirap para sa atin ang lumabas. Diba? And yet, nangyari lahat ng ito ng mabilisan. Sige. Maraming salamat, uh, Joseph. Siguro mas maraming mga uh, uh, sharing no? pagdating ng question and answer. Thank you. Salamat, Attorney Virgie, sa pagpapalalim dun sa pag-intindi natin no? kung saan nanggagaling ang US at ano yung disenyo niya. Uh, nabanggit ni Virgie na isa sa main push ay ng, ng US, particularly military policy niya at agenda niya sa Pacific ay yung deterrence o pagkontra sa China. No? So importante rin maintindihan natin from the side naman ng China, saan ba nang gagaling at yung pag-emerge uh, pag, uh, niya no, as a rising power, anong implikasyon nito sa geopolitics at, at sa Pilipinas in particular. Swerte po tayo kasama natin si uh, Walden Bello para uh, tulungan tayong maintindihan itong mga issue na to. Good afternoon, Walden. Hey, uh, Joseph. Uh, uh... Okay, uh, maraming salamat sa uh, I Defend uh, para sa imbitasyon na magbigay ng uh, isang analysis dito sa ating uh, talakaya ngayong hapon. Um, Unang-una, um, yung siguro sa atin na uh, napakinggan yung convention speech ni Trump dun sa Republican National Convention. Uh, klarong klaro na uh, China is the enemy and that uh, intensified na yung attack on China. And uh, napakinggan natin na uh, klaro rin na yung campaign pitch ni Trump ngayon against Biden is si Biden, yung Democratic candidate, is China's man. Uh, so overall, one of the themes na tinahit talaga ni Trump uh, is that um, um, elect me because I am going to uh, confront China and uh, my opponent cannot do that uh, because he's weak. Okay. Um, pero even before yung uh, Republican National Convention, um, um, talagang very intense na yung uh, economic relations between China and the United States. Uh, for all in, uh, yung, yung nga, merong ongoing trade war, okay? At binibira na rin ng United States, ng Estados Unidos, yung mga Chinese corporations um, uh, preventing them from accessing raw American technology at branding them like TikTok Rao is a national security uh, risk. Uh, of course, maraming mga bata na magagalit dyan, uh, branding TikTok as a national security risk. At yung Huawei, uh, Rao is uh, stealing American technology. So my trade war, my technological war, and of course, uh, we have to ask ourselves inevitably, is this in fact going to lead to some sort of uh, military confrontation? And sa uh, tingin ko, we are now nearer a military confrontation than we've ever been, uh, you know, since the beginning of the deterioration of U.S.-China relationships. Um, um, beginning with the Obama uh, administration. At, um, and the center of confrontation is the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea. Okay? Um, in fact, uh, may mga, uh, may, eh, in non, uh, let me just say that there is really ongoing uh, maneuvers right now in that area that could easily trigger uh, conflict. Um, merong mga overflights ang United States, deliberate overflights over 
territories claimed by China. Uh, and they are meant to say that China, uh, we have, you cannot claim ownership of these areas. Um, and uh, there is um, uh, cat and mouse kind of maneuvers between US ships and Chinese ships na could result in collisions. No? And in fact, napakataas yung worries about naval collisions taking place because you know they're playing a game of chicken in the area no and uh yung marami mga military analysts are basically saying well um pag nagka collision diyan then that can escalate into warfare uh of a higher sort no uh, including co conventional war so this situation now has been aggravated by the intensification of the rhetoric against China and making China the center of the electoral battle uh, in the uh, United States. So um, let me just uh, go to the uh, on, on, on China and the West Philippine Sea. Unang una, uh, I would just like to say that um, uh, I think Filipinos are rightfully angered by the way that China is behaving in the area, okay, uh, which is basically uh, just ripping apart multilateral um, or United Nations accords like the UN Conference on the Law of the Seas that basically says that uh, we have the uh, um, uh, you know, that, that we have an ec exclusive economic zone in the area that uh, belongs to the Philippines, okay? Um, and, um, and yung mga um, taking over, uh, first of Mischief Reef and then of Scarborough Show, I mean, these are all extremely provocative, walang legal basis. And then, of course, yung unilateral declaration of China that it... Uh, uh, yung nine dash line that all or 90 percent of the west philippine sea or south china sea belongs to it it's almost like it's treating it like an inland lake so um the uh, situation um yung yung court in the hay uh, was right you know that uh china has no legal basis to claim uh, all these different features uh, maritime features of the area and to unilaterally abrogate um, the United Nations grant of exclusive economic zones to uh, different countries, uh, six or seven ASEAN countries no? uh, in that area. So um, um, uh, that's very clear that this bullying behavior cannot be uh, tolerated. On the other hand, uh, I would also say that we have to look much closer at this situation. Uh, because what is motivating China to behave this way? And what is motivating China to behave this way is principally dom uh, defensive concerns. No? Um, and um, Beron Ren, of course, young uh, resource concerns, um, you know, uh, to be able to monopolize the resource uh, in the area. But Young defensive concerns are, are very um, um, uh, prominent. Now, uh, what do we mean by defensive concerns? Uh, merong talagang strategic dilemma in China uh, with respect to the United States that practically encircles it in the southeastern, uh, or in the South China Sea. Okay, um, and um, uh, the very vulnerable ang southeastern coast ng China uh, to U.S. military attacks, especially since the U.S. has an offensive posture with respect to China. Uh, yung defensive posture ng China is confirmed even by the U.S. Uh, Defense Department analysis, no? na strategic defense sila. But the U.S. in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, yung its doctrine and the Bangat ni Rene Virgito uh, is um, uh, what is called the air sea battle. The main objective of which is to make sure that US 
uh, missiles can get through the uh, Chinese defensive shield in the area and um, um, threaten the basic young know, southeastern um, China, Shanghai, Guangzhou, etc. These are the industrial heartland of China. So, yung malaking strategic dilemma ng China. And so, uh, China has moved uh, to uh, try to remedy that principally through a position of forward defense, which is to move um, um, its forces further and further into the Asia-Pacific area uh, in order to push back U.S. forces further that, that surround it at this point. Kasi napaka-powerful yung U.S. Armada in this area, my Seventh Fleet. There are the bases in Japan, uh, um, you know, and, and um, you know, two, uh, uh, one um, uh, aircraft carrier group, which is often supplemented by another aircraft carrier group. So it is, yung Indo-Pacific Command is the most powerful unified command of the United States, and it has an aggressive postures. So I guess uh, what I would just like to say is, um, ang problema rito is um, China has um, valid defensive concerns. The problem is that the way that it has pursued these defensive concerns unilaterally, which is mischief reef, Scarborough Shoal, uh, command, uh, you know, saying it owns the South China Sea, instead of having a more cooperative stance that would, in fact, promote peace, as well as good relations with its neighbors and move the United States out of the area. No? So ito yung, ito yung shortcut methods of China of just riding roughshod over the, the valid interests and claims uh, of its neighboring countries. So, uh, you know, so what should we be doing therefore? And I would just like to end with this. Um, I've always held na napahalaga na magkaroon ng uh, isang uh, um, diplomatic posture ang Philippine government and ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and it not be limited to just running to the United States like the uh, Aquino administration did uh, and uh, um, you know, this is the reason that we entered the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement was basically the position of the Aquino administration is let's bring in the United States even more deeper, even deeper than the Visiting Forces Agreement uh, into the Philippines and, you know, intensify its military presence in the area. At the same time, uh, we should not... Uh, go into the other extreme uh, of the Duterte administration, which is basically, okay, uh, we can't tackle China, therefore we will just lick its ass. You know? And that's basically what Loxin and Duterte have been doing, which is, although sometimes they engage in some rhetoric, anti, uh, you know, we, we need to protect our uh, assets in the uh, uh, South China Sea, in the West Philippine Sea, that, um, you know, nevertheless, it has been to placate China and to us, na mention na, nang, uh, iba, uh, to say that inutil sharon and you just live um, uh, uh, with the bully, okay? And, uh, and, and in fact, you know, try to get something out of this relationship, but essentially submit yourself to its uh, will. So what uh, I had proposed uh, even after the, you know, as far ago, as, as four years ago, is an alternative strategy with, five, uh, you know, four or five uh, steps. And I would just like to end with um, articulating these steps, okay? Uh, and uh, ang, ang position ko is, um, the, is that... Um, let me just see. Just, just a second, please. Okay. So what is the alternative? Um, you know, first, 
since strategic defense is a central motivation for China's behavior, the Philippines and China can agree to have bilateral talks on how to bring down the tension between the countries. So, umpisahan with bilateral talks on military issues. Okay. Um, second, perhaps simultaneously with Philippine-China bilateral talks, China should take seriously ASEAN's long-standing offer to hold multilateral talks on a code of conduct to govern the maritime behavior of all parties with claims to the South China Sea. In fact, they agreed to this back in 2002. We just need really to push all parties uh, into this. Uh, three, should these two confidence-building measures achieve some success, ASEAN and China could move on to negotiations to achieve significant demilitarization and denuclearization of the South China Sea with the goal of coming up with a multilateral treaty that would be binding on all parties, including third parties like the United States. Okay. And um, of course, this would probably mean that in return for China dismantling its military structures in Mischief Reef and other uh, um, reefs in the area, um, the Philippines would abandon EDCA and the Visiting uh, Forces Agreement. Uh, I would just like to say that in terms of uh, ASEAN, uh, this would be really something that would be a further development of two earlier ASEAN agreements. The agreement to make ASEAN a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality, soft fund, and the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Agreement. Finally, ASEAN and China could begin the process of resolving their competing claims on exclusive economic zones and continental shelves and discussing joint development of fisheries and other resources. Okay, So um, we need not um, go right away into making treaties. We can maybe have de facto arrangements um, uh, that would not involve any of the parties uh, losing their uh, faith. Now, of course, this is not an easy task to do, but in fact, this is what diplomacy is all about. You try to move um, 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 relations between parties from conflict into negotiated solutions. And that was precisely the problem with the Aquino administration, uh, that uh, it, it immediately polarized you know, the situation by bringing in EDCA. And that was also the problem with the, or is the problem with the Duterte administration since it has gone the other way, which is to move towards um, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically saying we're not, we don't have a choice. We'll just live up with China and let's get some economic benefits from this whole process. So it is a, a lack of imagination uh, on the part of these two administrations uh, um, and the failure to understand and the 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 that and 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 the inability to think imaginatively as to how to resolve these issues. So uh, that's really the, the situation at this point. Just one last thing or, um, is that um, basically uh, this means that the Philippines should really work actively to bring its ASEAN partners uh, into this process uh, to stiffen up their negotiating positions with respect to China. Uh, right now, uh, ang naiiwan na lang doon uh, is Vietnam. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, uh, but with a Philippine, Vietnam, Malaysia kind of um, position, that could really strengthen the, um, the, the um, power uh, of the uh, uh, um, ASEAN countries if, if they act uh, um, uh, jointly. So, uh, the last point that I would just uh, 
like to say is that these are all extremely urgent at this point in time uh, because of the aggressiveness of the Trump administration. Uh, you cannot separate its economic technological initiatives from the military initiatives um, uh, because there is a momentum there. Uh, because even the Trump people uh, see economics and military initiatives are just part of the same continuum. Those are, there's a very dangerous kind of thinking at this point in time. So um, let me just say that um, um, last January, when uh, President Duterte said he was going to withdraw from the visiting forces agreement, Katawasi Joseph Rito, I wrote an article that was widely circulated uh, both for Rappler as well as the Philippine Daily Inquirer that said that even though he's a mass murderer, I support Duterte's withdrawal from the visiting forces agreement because that is good for the national interest, even as I condemn his human rights violations. You know? um, I should have learned my lesson that you can't trust this crazy idiot, okay? Because a month and a half later, what does he do is he says, okay, we're now going back on our promise to withdraw from the VFA um, and um, whatever they call it, suspension, frozen or whatever. It's very clear that it's, um, they, um, they, um, they have um, um, gone back. Uh, re they've retreated. And it's fairly clear that um, a great part of the reason for this, I think, lumabas na rin to dun sa sinabi ni Virgie, is because basically the U.S. has laid down the line, especially the, the armed forces of the Philippines, which is basically in Monday, armed forces of the Philippines is very much of an appendage of the U.S. military. So the U.S. basically told the AFP, you don't screw around. Okay? If you screw around with us, we know how to be able to reduce your military capabilities. Okay? And uh, my sense is the AFP talked to Duterte that uh, you've crossed a red line. And then just like he went back on his promises about regulating mining, uh, just as he's gone back on a number of uh, uh, positions that, that uh, he's held, uh, like um, withdrawing from the World Trade Organization because it was destroying Philippine agriculture, Duterte backtracked on this one. But of course, you know, hindi naman malakas yung belief niya in terms of national interest or, or people's interest, and he's only out really to to enhance his power. Uh, that wasn't a problem for him. Uh, so. Um, uh, you know, basically that's where we're at at this point. Uh, we are saddled with an administration uh, that uh, is basically uh, willing to make a deal with the United States, uh, willing to make a deal with China, uh, but does not have any strategic sense um, and uh, is um, does not believe in an independent foreign policy, okay, just like Teddy Luxin does not believe in Filipino, okay, uh, and, uh, and, and so wala talaga tayong, we don't have a coherent policy, it's all responses to pressures, and uh, in terms of national interest, that doesn't really figure it's really the interest of the ruling group in the Philippines at this point. That is the centerpiece of Duterte's strategy. But let us point out that, as others have already mentioned, this has been a consistent problem with um, uh, foreign policy across all administrations. No? It's not just Duterte. It's been the traditional submission to the interests of foreign powers, okay, that uh, especially the United States that has guided Philippine uh, foreign uh, policy. And that's really what has to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walden.
So, very clear po dun sa last two presentations natin. No? Not, yun nga, we are in the, mid in the middle of yung banggaan ng dalawang superpowers at yung pag-advance nila ng kanilang mga interes. No? At ang, ang positive dito, at ay hindi naman pala ganun kasimple na sinasabi ni Duterte dun sa zona niya, no? da, anong gusto niyong gawin natin? Wala tayong pwedeng gawin kasi hindi natin kayang harapin ang military might ng China. In-outline ni Walden yung na meron, no? merong mga possibilities for for how we can approach uh, and find resolution to these uh, territorial disputes. Bago po tayo magpalalim dun sa diskusyon, no? natulungan na po tayo na i-unpack yung mga komplikadong mga issue na to. Magbe-break lang po tayo sandali at magpapalabas tayo ng isang maiksing video. Tapos pipikapin po natin yung discussion pagkatapos ng video. Pagkatapos nito, babalik lang ba tayo sa normal? Sa mabilis na takbo ng buhay, araw-araw ay sugal. Silang panalo tayo ang talunan sa araw-araw na pakikipagsapalaran. Yan ba ang babalikan pagkatapos? Pagkatapos nito Pagkatapos nito Balik lang ba sa dating gawin Sa marahas na takbo ng buhay Puno ng takot at pangamba Ligalig ang laking kaulayan Mula umaga hanggang gabi Pag-ising natin 
Okay. from that uh, song ano yung sitwasyon natin in relation to the COVID-19 crisis no kanina nabanggit ko po yung Sona speech no kung saan sinabi nga niya na inutil siya in the wake of yung conflict pero in that same speech um Duterte also made a plea to uh, Chinese president Jinping Xi Jinping sabi niya that if they have the vaccine can they allow us to be one of the first or if it is needed if we have to buy it, no, that they will be granted credit so that we can normalize as fast as possible. At syempre, ang reaction ng Chinese government dito ay natuwa ang China. No? At sabi nung foreign ministry spokesperson nila that Duterte's policy pronouncements are, quote, in keeping with the fundamental interest of the Philippines, the shared aspiration of regional countries, and the trend of the times for peace and development. We appreciate President Duterte's remarks and stand ready to properly resolve maritime disputes with the Philippines through friendly consultations to jointly safeguard peace and stability in South China Sea and the entire region. So siguro ang para ma-bring in ho to sa discussion natin yung issue of the pandemic no, that we are all facing. Ano ba ang tingin niyo po ang impact nitong global health crisis na ito sa geopolitics sa region? Nabago ba? Meron bang pagbabago sa postura ng China at ng US halimbawa? Dahil buong mundo ang tinamaan at uh, hanggang sa kasalukuyan ay reeling from the health as well as the economic impacts of the pandemic. Sino pong gustong sumagot sa mga panelists natin? Well, uh, I'll take a Sige, Walter. How about that? Oh, well, um, ginagawang propaganda uh, the, on the one hand, um, ang China uh, was definitely at fault in the beginning kasi sinupress nga ng Chinese government yung, um, yung um, news about the, um, about the pandemic breaking out in Wuhan. No? And um, so, that was that cost us about a few weeks uh, in which um, it could have been brought under control. No, um, pero recently, um, okay, because of a very strict lockdown, they were able to control the the uh, the spread of the virus in China, and so they've um, uh, then said that. Um, you know, we can share our experience with the rest of the world. Uh, you know, we'll, you know, send face masks to, you know, we'll put our productive capacity in terms of helping produce young personal uh, protective equipment. Um, but basically, they've tried to turn that around to say that, uh, in fact, China is now ready to help uh, the rest of the world in dealing with this. No? Um, but clearly, it's, it's part of the whole propaganda game. Uh, yung U.S. naman, um, you know the you know the when things got out of control in the U.S., um, uh, especially with the pandemic spreading, and the U.S. now has the most infections, and uh, from the from the pandemic, no. Um, you see, Trump naman has tried his own propaganda to deflect the fact that he's been the one mainly responsible for what's happening uh, in terms of the screw up uh, sa U.S. over the pandemic that, um, that um, you know, he's now blaming China. That basically, tawag nga niya, kung flu. You know, so napaka-racist yung term na yun. No? So, Ginagawa, both sides are using the pandemic in a sort of a battle for hearts and minds, or in a sort of a propaganda battle that is taking place. So maski yung pandemic uh, in which we really need a united global effort for this, uh, instead of that happening, uh, you are um, you are my one-upmanship in terms of the uh, of the positions of the two uh, of the of the um, of the US and China and um, 
So instead of a united effort, there's all this talk about developing vaccines. Who's going to be the first to develop a vaccine? And of course, si Duterte has, um, for, for, yes, we all know fallen for that. Um, sabi niya that he will be the first trial to be a guinea pig for Russia in his vaccine efforts. And then if if China can develop it, mauna raw yung mga pinakamahirap sa Pilipinas na makakakuha ng vaccine. So it's, problema is the coronavirus is being kicked around as a political football instead of being seriously treated as a pandemic, especially in the Philippines. So nakita naman natin dito na wala naman talagang interest to contain yung pandemic si Duterte. The main interest is consolidating yung dictatorship. No? So yung 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 position niya is is fairly clear. Uh, what is your strategy for the pandemic? It's to wait for the vaccine. No, I mean this is such a defeatist kind of uh, of uh, posture at this point. Yeah, salamat Walden. Si Ed, may gusto ng dagdag. Medyo may limitasyon at ang iba nating speakers sa oras yeah. eh, na no? so bigyan ko muna si Ed ng salamat. chance. Uh, ang gusto ko sabihin, no, na uh, bilang sagot na sa katanungan ni Joseph is that what what is actually happening now all over the world in response to the pandemic is unilateralism parang to each his own nangyayari kanya-kanya na lang there has been little or no sharing of resources no attempt to reach across uh, other countries and other peoples in order to uh, have some kind of a shared uh, response i think the only exception to this is cuba which is uh, sending doctors and other medical personnel uh, in many parts of the of the world no? upon request of course philippines has not requested for cuban doctors so wala silang pinapadala dito so yung unilateralism na yon is, is very very palpable and very evident and that is also quite present in the southeast asian region kaya any attempt for example to to appeal to asean for example to do something about covid will be useless uh, I have checked the ASEAN website and there's virtually nothing there about uh, how ASEAN as a regional grouping is responding to the crisis. Uh, the only thing that was there was there was some meeting, a very low level meeting of uh, uh, health uh, officials, I think, but they, they did not come to any conclusion. Then there was this uh, um, media ops uh, a video a conference of all foreign ministers. They were all dressed in their national costumes. And all they said was that we are in solidarity with each other, period. After that, nothing. So really, you know, it has, this has, it's quite disturbing, uh, to say the least, that uh, at a time when uh, reaching across borders and boundaries and helping each other and sharing, is most needed that is when that entire process has, has uh, practically failed yeah thanks thanks ed mukhang yun rin yung point mo earlier ano na talagang kailangan may fundamental shift dun sa how we view foreign relations talaga at yung missing element dito yung people's participation at yung how it should reflect kumbaga the aspirations then no so na uh, Cora, you wanted to add something earlier. Ah, naka mute ka, Cora. Sorry. Uh, I was going to say actually, uh, p- picking up from what Walden said about you know uh, the posturing of uh, Duterte, you know <laughs> sometimes it's really unbelievable to see a a country leader to be speaking that way, but he is that. Um, you know, the, 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 the most disturbing for me really is uh, yung, yung sinabi niya na uh, una tayo sa pila, no? <laughs> Pagka merong vaccine and, and that he is willing to, to be one of the persons who will test it. Uh, but I would also like us to look into the, uh, the business angle of, of, of vaccine uh, production. So, malaking negosyo yan. At uh, uh, tingin ko, um, contrary to what uh, Ed is saying na nagkakanya-kanya itong mga ito, 
actually uh, to a certain level meron silang uh, cooperation no uh, ngayon uh, 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 makikita ba natin na eventually merong monopolyo pagdating dito sa sa vaccine production to what extent would it really benefit the people uh, in terms of it being uh, available and accessible affordable uh, uh, for the people um, at this point I would also like to say that uh, the, the Duterte government when it started it wanted to look into the health uh, um, policy of Cuba, you know, sending a delegation to Cuba. And uh, as a follow through to that, when we had this pandemic, we, we actually wrote a letter to the DFA to uh, remind them to, to kind of sought uh, uh, help from Cuba. And um, <laughs> we did not get any response uh, <laughs> to that letter. So we, we could see that uh, this is something that uh you know the big powers will uh economic powers will will be gaining from uh, uh and it will not uh, benefit the people in general okay thanks cora virgie Ako gusto ko lang uh, i-emphasize no yung uh, parang tong si Duterte is following the footsteps of ano eh, Trump eh no yung bang walang kaseryosohan ano o sa, sa pag-address nitong problema natin sa, sa COVID or sa pandemic. Katulad din ni Trump, no? walang kaseryosohan no? sa pag-address. Katulad din ni, pra, ni, 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 ni Trump, instead of using no? or uh, bigyan pa na mas malaking pondo para i-address ang problema sa, uh, sa COVID, mas nandun siya sa uh, paano pa bigyan ng mas marami pang pondo ang kanyang militar. At ganun din ang ating, ano, ang ating gobyerno. Sa halip na naka-focus sa COVID ay paano pa bigyan ng mas malaking pondo itong ating militar at ang mga pulis. No? Uh, kaya doon makikita mo yung uh, ano ba to? Uh, uh, ano been, yun ba following his uh, his footsteps at nakita rin natin kung paano uh, itong pandemic na ito really exposes uh, Duterte's incompetency. Pero nakikita rin natin dahil Matindi rin nung, uh, ang pag, uh, pag-atake no, ng mamayan dito sa incompetency ni Duterte. Ang naging sagot ni Duterte ay, di ba, ay itong anti-terror bill. Ibig sabihin, uh, the Duterte administration is taking advantage of this pandemic, di ba, dahil restricted ang ating mobility, di ba, parang mas mahirap sa atin para kumilos. Kaya pati yung pagkilos, pati yung ating freedom of expression ay nire-restrict. At sa gitna ng pandemic, eh, na sa batas nga ang anti-terror bill. At ngayon, hindi na hindi magkakasya doon, ano? Tinutulak pa ang atsatsa. Dito makikita natin how these two governments are really taking advantage of this pandemic instead of addressing, 'di ba? Ay lalo pa, yung sabi nga ni Walden, trying or attempting attempting to consolidate its power. Salamat, Attorney Virgie. At this point, gusto kong i-entertain yung ilang questions no, na pumasok sa mga social media accounts. No? Ito mula sa I Defend page, si Ron Jonathan. Sabi niya, sabi ni Loxin, hindi daw pababayaan ang win ng Pilipinas sa unklos. Yun nga ba ang ginagawa ng government? No? Sinong gusto sumagot? No, no? That's ang isa pang tanong naman. Related naman sa China, ano naman po ang Belt Road Initiative ng China? May tulong ba sa Philippines itong programa na ito? Sinong gusto pong sumagot dun sa dalawang tanong na yun? So yung una ay may, kin- may kinalaman doon sa binanggit ni Walden, no, yung arbitral ruling at kung ano ang ginagawa ng Duterte administration to, to push that uh, award. And then secondly, Belt and Road Initiative. Well, then, gusto mo bang sagutin yung unang tanong? Uh, well, very inconsistent yung mga pronouncements ng administration on that. Uh, you know, basically, kinabayaan nila yun was once they took office, uh, parang kwan na lang eh, just uh, pro forma saying, okay, we won, but not really emphasizing it or pushing it as a centerpiece of diplomacy dun sa West uh, Philippine Sea. 
Um, but when people get really angry na walang ginagawa, then they come out with a statement na hindi raw papabayaan. So, but seriously speaking, I, I don't think that they really want to make it a centerpiece no? uh, 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 of uh, policy towards China. Uh, so, ang tingin ko, eh, panay laway lang yung sinasabi nila uh, uh, Loxin uh, on this on this issue. Yung Belt and Road, um, basically, um, hindi ko lang analysis ito, pero basically, kwanyan eh, uh, maraming um, not very good environmental and social impacts yung uh, yung mga projects that are funded by China on the Belt and Road um, Initiative. No? And uh, uh, marami ng mga countries have been complaining about, um, you know, some of the things, some of the conditionalities ng uh, yung Belt and Road. And they themselves, including Malaysia, have revised agreements on, on that, no? Uh, so, yung merong Belt and Road projects dito sa atin, sa, sa, sa Quezon, uh, and it's been, malaki talaga yung magiging impact ng building of a hydroelectric dam uh, in the area. No? So, um, so, yung Belt and Road, I would say, is... Um, we really need to monitor it very closely because um, marami talagang mga uh, not very good environmental impacts at saka yung mga benefits from that are likely to just flow to yung mga elites, ruling elites of these various um, uh, countries. At saka may, aside from that, um, the interest of China is, uh, kasi ang dami, meron talagang malaking problema yung ekonomiya nila in terms of uh, yung non-performing loans, mga state enterprises, many of them would be going bankrupt under a, uh, you know, capitalist rules. But since they are being funded by the state, they um, they're not yet bankrupt. But they, yung there's an attempt to use uh, the Belt and Road Initiative to be able to get this um, state enterprises to. Um, be more profitable. So parang export of surplus capital ng China yon to avoid the bankruptcy of uh, state-run firms. So malaki talaga ang self-interest ng China that, uh, in terms of its uh, in terms of its uh, um, interests uh, dito sa Belt and Road. Um, may nagsasabi na may mga imperial designs yan, uh, but I would be more skeptical on those claims that this is really uh, an imperial effort just like yung mga uh, Western countries in terms of the way that they uh, engage in imperialism. Sa tingin ko mas malaki pa yung finding uh, an outlet for surplus capital to save Chinese enterprises from bankruptcy, uh, John. Um, yeah. So that's my sense. Um, it deserves another discussion ano, altogether itong BRI. Uh, gusto ko lang ibalik ulit kay Ed, uh, if he's still around, no? yung, yung point about the arbitral ruling, anong pagtingin mo dito? At, kasi may binanggit ka earlier in your presentation na, na nananawagan ka actually ng new thinking no? na kailangan isang tabi yung mga, even yung concepts of exclusive economic zones ba, kasama dun sa binabanggit mo na you know, it requires new approaches, no more common common resources ang pagtingin. No? Anong pagtingin mo dun sa, sa arbitral ruling na yun, yung win na yun supposedly for the Philippines? Yeah, well, yung arbitral ruling by, uh, by this uh, independent uh, body, by the way, it's an independent body. It, was, it is not a UN body, although it used uh, UNCLOS, provisions of UNCLOS as a basis for arriving at a decision and the decision was 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 just to say that china's claims or uh, you know for dun sa kanilang nine dash line are uh, no, are invalid it did not rule on uh, issues of ownership 
in that rule on issues of rights of the Philippines to uh, to whatever it is claiming or whatever it says it has jurisdiction or yun ang dapat maliwanag sa atin ang sinabi lang ng, ng ruling na yun is that China's claims to the nine dash line is in, uh, are invalid period wala silang sinabi na the Philippines has the right or China has the right or ownership or whatever wala silang ganong ruling and in the second place uh, because China did not participate in the in the deliberations, uh, then it, it's obviously an empty, you know, it's an empty ruling. No? It's it's a parang moral ano lang yan, moral booster lang yan sa Philippine government uh, position on the South China Sea disputes, but nothing more. In other words, uh, plus the fact that even if China participated, the ruling is non-enforceable. Hindi pwedeng ma-enforce yan dahil wala namang enforcing capability yung uh, yung uh, arbitration panel na yon arbitration in other words bahala na kayo ito yung ruling namin oh, do what you want with it uh, ang ang masasabi ko rin is that uh, as far as unclos is concerned actually there is a very important provision in unclos that that says that uh, the maritime areas are actually the common heritage of mankind yun yun yung ano Yun yung pinag ng gusto during the UNCLOS deliberations. Remember, it took 15 years before UNCLOS could be uh, could be adopted. Uh, and the United States did not sign it. Why? Because during the deliberations, the United States position, the United States and other developed countries' position was that uh, they, they were against the concept of the common heritage of mankind. Gusto nila that uh, uh, the open seas and the resources in it are not owned by anyone, are owned by no one, and therefore can be exploited by anyone. Which which means those who have the resources, those who have the capability to exploit the resources in the seas and in the seabed, sila yung makikinabang. But the developing country's uh, position was that open seas and the resources in it are the common heritage of mankind and therefore should be shared by all, not just by one country or any one uh, regional block or whatever. So yun ang naging ano, yun ang isang na medyo nakakalimutan dun sa mga discussions of, about UNCLOS that UNCLOS actually uh, made this very important uh, contribution to any uh, discussion on, uh, on, on territorial disputes in the on, in the open seas. Yung, yung concept of the common heritage of mankind. And I think this is something that we should build on. Government should take this seriously, and more important, the peoples uh, of countries that are involved in territorial disputes should take this seriously and use it to pressure their governments, whether it's the Philippine government, the Chinese government, the Vietnamese government, or any other government uh, in, in the area that has claims to, uh, to uh, resources in the open seas should, uh, should uh, put this matter forward. Uh, do naman sa ano sa talks uh, between the Philippines and China. The Chinese position has always been bilateral talks. Now, whether this is the best way to do about go about it is uh, I'm not uh, is is open to dispute. But the China China has always offered bilateral talks with the Philippines, and the Philippines has always refused to enter into bilateral talks. Kasi tinanong ko yung mga DFA officials nung bakit ayon nyo. Eh, siyempre, ang laki-laki ng China. Sabi nyo, talo tayo. Ano? Sabi ko, uh, wala kayong tiwala sa inyong sarili when you meet China in, in bilateral talks na titiklop na lamang kayo dahil malaking bansa yung kausap nyo. It was a very uh, defeatist attitude. But now, apparently, uh, Philippine government is is now open to bilateral talks. and and uh, but But everything is being kept under wraps, no? I don't know whether the, those talks have started. There's nothing that has come out from the Philippine government as to whether those bilateral talks, have, uh, which have been agreed on upon by the two governments, are, are ongoing. And what is the progress of this? Ano, two years ago pa ito, eh, na ng agreement to hold bilateral talks to resolve the territorial disputes. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Uh, thank you dun sa pagbanggit mo nung sa unclos. Ano? Kasi usually... Parang ang na-emphasize yung exclusive economic zones, no? At hindi yung idea of, as you said, no? Common heritage, common pooled resources. I think 
uh, importanteng mapasok nun sa debate o sa discourse on uh, uh, resolving territorial disputes. Ngayon, um, I'm looking at the time, no? nagpas na tayo ng oras. Um, I would like to give all our speakers, si Attorney Virgie, I unfortunately had to leave already. Pero itong uh, last messages from our speakers, pero I, if, if possible, maybe we can touch on a progressive agenda no? moving forward. How do we push that progressive agenda now that um, we're facing a, a global pand uh, a pandemic na nagsasabing may opportunities rin no there's a crisis but there's also an opportunity to 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 shift the discourse and to push more progressive policies so in terms of um in, you know um independent foreign policy ano ba ang pwede nating gawin as progressives pwedeng si Tita Cora muna magsimula and then Ed and then Walden uh well in terms of uh, uh pursuing an independent foreign policy, I think that um, we need to, uh, to study, you know, uh, maging mag-aral tayo at maging mapanuri um, sa konteksto ng kasalukuyang kalagayan natin. Oh, may pandemia, uh, merong uh, impending economic uh, downturn. Uh, but at, at the same time, um, looking at alternatives you no know, defining what really what we really want uh, as as a nation and i think that uh, uh, if we um, we want to pursue this uh, there has to be some key uh, you know uh, work that we need to do uh, for one i'm i'm thinking that uh, this could be a there could be a possibility of, uh, again, uh, I don't want to burden focus on the global south, but this is something that I think they should be picking up um, and, you know, leading the, the, the study and research um, so that, uh, you know, this is an important input that we could give um, to, to our government. I know many of us who don't believe in it anymore and to our Congress. But more importantly, that people uh, are informed um, and are able to understand this so that we can uh, possibly create a critical mass. It does not have to be uh, a majority of the Filipinos, but uh, creating a critical mass has always been an important work that we do in, in the social movements. Um, how we do that, it depends on, you know, uh, uh, how we will um, uh, strategize and plan out uh, what we can do, but um, I that that's what I'm thinking at the moment, and uh, I hope that uh, we can pick it up from here. You know, this seems to be a very good beginning. Um, I've learned uh, so much from it as well, uh, and it brings me back to. <laughs> to the time when I am trying to study this. I continue to be a student of foreign relations to this day, although I have been focusing on security and defense issues uh, in the last uh, um, last uh, several years. Okay, salamat, Cora. Ed? Yeah, for me, an independent foreign policy is basically an internationalist foreign policy. It is a foreign policy uh, that uh, thinks not only of itself, but uh, also of other peoples and other countries. And uh, it, it is based on uh, uh, notions like mutual interest, uh, mutual uh, benefits, uh, cooperation across borders in order to address and uh, the various social, political, and economic challenges that, uh, that peoples of the world are now facing and uh, and that that i think is the only way that we could actually resolve uh, international conflicts by by putting our heads together reaching across peoples across uh, beyond our boundaries no? so we're not just limited to what uh, what is good for the filipino people but what is good for the filipino people and also and does not harm other peoples in other countries. And that for me is a true independent foreign policy, which is internationalist. Thanks, Ed. Well then.
Nakamute ka, Walden. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I think, first of all, we have to end this uh, ping-pong diplomacy natin uh, where, on the one hand, you have a foreign policy that sides with the United States, which has been the traditional foreign policy, and then a new foreign policy, which then moves to the other extreme, which sides with uh, uh, China. Uh, and at the same time, a confused foreign policy, because on the one hand, Duterte does one thing, and on the other hand, the armed forces does another thing, which is to uh, side with the United States. So my pagka incoherent talaga yung foreign policy natin ngayon. And I think that what we really need at this point is a coherent and independent foreign policy. Uh, and we must, according to Cora, I agree that we must really build a critical mass uh, you know, for this kind of uh, foreign policy. The second thing is my urgent yung demilitarization of the um, West Philippine Sea, South China Sea because of the intensifying uh, uh, difficulties in the relationship uh, between the United States and China. So we must not underestimate the possibilities that this, uh, this kind of um, uh, shadow conflicts can escalate into something bigger and we will be caught in the middle of it. No? So yung proposals for demilitarization with the Philippines and ASEAN and China sitting down uh, to, to in fact create a um, uh, demilitarized zone uh, from which nuclear powers uh, would be uh, and their weaponry would be excluded. Uh, the nuclearized and demilitarized zone is very, very important at this uh, point in time. And then thirdly, I certainly agree with Ed na, you know, the, we really need to have a foreign policy that respects other peoples and uh, does not just look to our interests, but looks to the interests of other peoples, particularly the oppressed of the world, you know, and the oppressed classes. You know? uh, so uh, I, I think we can have both a foreign policy that is nationalistic in terms of promoting the interests of the Filipino people, but at the same time, an, a foreign policy that in promoting the interests of the Filipino people does not harm the interests of other peoples, uh, and in fact, is you know something that coincides with the interests of other peoples. In other words, um, a people's foreign policy, not the foreign policy of elites. Thank you very much, Walden, for those uh, words. Thank you also to all our speakers. Uh, some city Vir attorney Virgie and uh, uh, Dr. Ed had to leave already, but uh, Tito Cora and Walden is still are still here. So maraming salamat po sa ating mga tagapagsalita ngayon. Uh, bilang pagtatapos po, uh, mahirap i- medyo komplikado yung ating diskusyon at uh, hirap i-summarize. Pero uh, gusto ko lang banggitin no, na sana gaya ng na, naranasan ko ngayon, no, nakatulong sa akin ang diskusyon na to na i-unpack yung mga komplikadong mga issue at mga concepts. Ano, ang, I think yung mga speakers natin na uh, given us a good overview, as I said earlier, of the basis, the drivers, and the elements of an independent foreign policy. Pero more than that, I think ang contribution ng discussion na to in terms of our expanding our view of foreign relations, na hindi siya nakahiwalay doon sa pangangailangan at interest ng taong bayan, ng mga, ng mga, mga mamamayan. At dito, tingin ko naka lahat ng speakers natin ay nagtulak ng uh, a new new ways no new approaches alternative and progressive approaches to building yung international solidarity and cooperate cooperation as foundations of of that independent foreign policy we also discuss no yung geopolitical challenges at napakalaki nito in terms of how the philippine uh, at at ito ang 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 dilemma ng uh, 
ng administrasyong ito at ng iba pang mga naunang mga administrasyon, paano ina-navigate yung uh, conflicting uh, interest ng dalawang superpowers no? na nag-express sa territorial conflict. No? Uh, yung binanggit ni Walden, ano, yung dangers of what we have right now is a subservient foreign policy or yung pag-swing sa pendulum from one superpower to, other, to another o ping-pong foreign policy as uh, Walden put it. No? At dito, uh, yung failed approaches, no? in-highlight na rin ni Walden, na hindi lang yung administrasyon ito, kundi nung na mga nakarang administrasyon na yun nga, sumusunod dun sa ganung parang pendulum. Pero siguro sa pagwawakas, I think maganda mag-end dun sa moving forward na aspeto ng diskusyon uh, dun sa mga alternative approaches na nabanggit na nga yung shared regional identity, shared common pool resources, common heritage of mankind, joint development. Ito yung mga ilan sa mga prinsipyong nabanggit. No? At miss on the question of the territorial dispute with China, maganda yung points ni Walden. No? Na, at uh, ito napaka i-contrast natin dito dun sa parang defeatist attitude ni Duterte na wala na tayong magagawa. Very clearly, meron pang pwedeng gawin bilateral talks with China, uh, yung ASEAN proposal for code of conduct, ASEAN and China negotiation to demilitarize and denuclearize the, the region at ang possibilities for a, perhaps a multilateral treaty down the line, and to begin this process of resolving the exclusive economic zone uh, issues uh, by looking at, discuss, uh, at joint development of fisheries and other resources. Um, as Walden put it also, no, try to move yung foreign relations from conflict to negotiated solutions to many of these problems. Gusto ko rin i-emphasize, no, uh, a point made and emphasized by most of our speakers ay yung importance rin of people-to-people -people relations and um, the importance of um, putting it at the center, in fact, you know, yung people's interest. At, uh, and Ed discussed this, no, yung, interna yung role played by non-state players uh, like international networks in confronting and engaging state and multi-state institutions. And in fact, pushing the discourse for uh, uh, improved uh, international relations based on peace and, um, and, and a shared prosperity. So marami po tayong na-discuss. No? I think yung last point natin about what kind of independent foreign policy we envision. I think now more than ever, no, as we face this pandemic, we need that new kind of foreign relations that is akin to what Ed uh, Tadem called internationalist foreign policy or what Walden termed as a more popular no, rather than elitist foreign policy. So muli, uh, maraming salamat po sa lahat ng uh, nanood at nakinig nitong discussion natin. Hanggang sa muli po. Balik ko muna po kay Rose para sa pagtatapos. Thank you. Maraming maraming salamat, uh, Joseph, no, sa napakagaling mong pag-facilitate at pag-moderate. At syempre, ikaw ang eksperto dyan. Dahil yan ang pinag-aaralan ng Focus on the Global South at na-share nyo sa amin. At nagpapasalamat po kaming marami doon sa ating mga uh, guests at panelists kasi napalinaw no, sa atin na hindi totoong merong independent foreign policy pala ang Pilipinas, no? Uh, para palang pingpong. Kung dati ay nakasubsob tayo sa Amerika, kung ano sabihin ng Amerika doon tayo, ngayon naman, ang sinusunod naman natin ay ang China. Ano ba talaga? Anong independent doon? Eh, meron ka palang kinikilingan. So, hindi siya independent. At napaka-importante nga nung binanggit na ang isang uh, independent foreign policy ay isang internationalist na framework, pro-people framework. Akala ng mga tao, kala ng ating karaniwang mamamayan, wala kaming kinalaman dyan sa foreign policy. Inglisa ng Inglisa niyan, hindi namin niya naiintindihan. Yung pala, no, dahil uh, parang ano ito, boundaryless na po tayo, seamless na ang mundo, na, nagdudugtong-dugtong na ang lahat ng ating Uh, pangangailangan, ang ating pagtugon, no? Uh, kaya dapat, ang nangunguna pa din ay ano ang kapakanan ng tao. Ano pa mang uh, policy yan, international policy pa man yan, or isang national policy. 
muli nananawagan po ang uh, I defend at ang para uh, na hindi tayo dapat manahimik. Sabi nga ni Tita Cora, bantayan natin, i-monitor natin at pag-aralan natin. Uh, at dapat ay magkaroon tayo ng isang alternatibong tayo ang gumawa at hindi lamang ang mga elitista. Uh, magwawakas po kami muli sa aming panawagan. Uh, lumabas tayo, lumaban tayo. Magandang gabi po sa ating lahat. COVID-19, people have lost their lives. COVID-19 uh, is spreading. The Department of Health reported nine new confirmed cases. Patients 25. Ay pinapatupad ngayon kaya ng social distancing. Na wala pa silang tatanggap na ayuda mula sa pamahalaan. Ang pagsunod sa isinasaad sa enhanced community. Marami ng mga inaasikasong COVID-19 patients ay maraming doktor. Ang hindi na po nakaka-uwi. Take urgent and aggressive action. Lumabas tayo. Lumabas tayo sa makitid na pananaw, papunta sa malawak na pagunawa sa isa't isa, lalo para sa mga taong na isasantabi at kailangan pakinggan. Lumabas tayo mula sa mga kanya-kanyang pag-aalala, lampas sa sari-sariling pangamba, dahil ang kailangang harapin ay sinusubok tayong magkakasama. Lumabas tayo mula sa pananahimik. Dahil ngayon, ngayong ang buhay natin ang nakataya, ay hindi dapat pipi at nakapikit. Napapastuli nila, tunong bangin. Lumabas tayo, mula sa dilim ng panlilinlang at pandilito. Malinaw sa atin kung ano ang gusto nating masalubong sa paglabas natin ngayon, papuntang bukas. Kabuhayan na sasapat. Kakain na buso, tahanan na kakanlong. Malayang umalam, kumilos, makialam. Unahin ang kapakanan ng mamamayan, kilalanin ang karapatan. Lalabas tayo sa kabanatang ito sa buhay natin. Baon ng katotohanan may mas malalaki pa tayong mapagwawagian. Na hindi na tayo papayag maipasok muli sa ganitong hirap na kalagayan dahil matutup tayong lumaban sa iba pang mga sakit ng lipunan. Lumabas tayo. Lumaban tayo.